I'm Dean Newland, and welcome to the Business of Intuition, where I coach, facilitate, train, and speak on the hard science and meaningful experience of intuitive leadership in business, so you can make better decisions, forge real connections, and creatively solve problems to amplify your impact and simplify your life. Welcome to the Business of Intuition. Before he died, my father-in-law told stories of his childhood, where horses were slowly being replaced by cars. He remembers seeing both cars and horses occupying the roads at the same time. And within a few years, cars dominated the roads in towns and freeway systems were built to connect people across America. Well, today we are facing a similar transition. Not one having to do with transportation, but with economics. Our centralized banking system and currency are being replaced by Bitcoin and other types of economic platforms. What and how we buy and sell is also under a huge transition. Before we had companies like Nike tell us what we needed, today we are telling Nike what we want. Decentralization, owning your own digital identity and creating value through NFTs is replacing the old business to business and business-to-consumer processes. In this new world order, how do we retain what it means to be human? Do we continue to expect from one another the same speed we do a Google search? Since leadership responds to the environment in which it lives, how do we lead and collaborate in a decentralized data world of the creator economy? Well, my next guest and I discussed these and many other challenges and opportunities. And whether you want to participate, you need to understand this trend, for either you will decide how you want to engage or others will for you. Haiti Romero Finger is my next guest. Holding 20 plus years of experience in tech, marketing, and PR, and now owning a full scope Web3 marketing agency. Katie consults and grows Web3 projects from zero to hero on a daily basis. In the past, Katie's, Katie participated in various panels, interviews, and keynotes around the world. For example, NFT New York City, AIBC Dubai, Meta Week Dubai, and more. Katie also has been recently recognized as an influential woman in tech and Web3 by female tech leader, leaders community and the Glass digital LTD. Katie's mission is simple, to create means for inclusivity and creativity to thrive in the Web3 space, contribute to the mass adoption of crypto, and to get more clicks into the Web3 space, as well as chicks. My next guest, Katie Romero Finger on the Business of Intuition. Okay, Katie, great to have you on the show. And uh, by the way, what's the time there in Spain? What, what time it's is it? 5 p.m. 5 p.m. We, we haven't done daylight savings yet. We do it this weekend. Okay. All right. Got it. Well, as we're starting the day, you're just sort of wrapping up. So it's good to have you. Um, I wanted mm -hmm. to start off with if you could kind of give us a little bit of a tutorial and a background. Obviously, internet and technology is constantly moving forward at lightning speed. And now we hear this thing called Web3 or Web 3.0, just so that we all have an understanding of what that means, because I would love to talk to you about how this is going to influence a lot of things in our life, including leadership. But what is Web3? Give us a little bit of background on that. Uh, I think the easiest way to describe it, I mean, there's a lot of components that go into Web3. So you have some people would say crypto, some people say blockchain, which is the actual technology behind it. And then a lot of people talk a, little, a lot about the what decentralization is or DeFi, which is decentralized finance. So Web3 was the word that they invented to kind of encapsulate all of those different components, but kind of the most, the most I think, rudimentary way of describing it, as I would say, is kind of taking away centralization of anything. So if we're talking about it in terms of a bank, we don't have a bank structure of hierarchy anymore. We have many people that own their own assets as opposed to having someone own their assets, invest their assets for them, and then you lose kind of power of that. So 
I, I always say that the easiest way to explain it is basically giving the people back power. And that's why yeah. it's such an evangelized, I believe, market, because people that truly believe what it is, it means instead of what we've lived, especially in my generation, kind of the Facebook generation, which is everything being fed to us. Now us as users are telling everyone else what we want. So we're telling brands what we want. We're telling, we're the creators as opposed to Nike telling us what we want to like, we're telling Nike what they need to produce and make for us. So, um, so walk me through, that, like, how would that look? I mean, I get it, sort of. <laughs> and, and I'm also trying to channel listeners so that I'm <laughs> going to pretend that I'm also them somewhere driving their car to work or what have you. So yeah. and let's say uh, we are, I don't know, $500 million company. We have services, we have products. We have business to business, B two B interactions, but we also have business to consumer. So we're going right to people, um, and we have websites, we have blogs. You know, we have leaders trying to develop their own thought leadership. How does that, what you just said, change the way we do things? What does it look like? What's the, what's different about our world? So I think, I mean, it depends on what product you're talking about. But if we're talking about it, kind of from a a leadership perspective. I think it means we're becoming more collaborative versus this top-down approach. So it's definitely, for example, I have a company and I don't think most people in Web3 really see themselves as like the boss and their team. Everything is very collaborative. We all own a piece of the pie at some level. So I think that's what you'll see. I think if you look at very big traditional structures, it's going to be very hard for them to web threeify, if you want to say it that uh, way, which uh, is why a lot of them are either acquiring web three products or web three companies, or they're building out a smaller team to like manage that and create a product that will be web three, because it's very antithetical to what the way traditional business runs is what web three is even preaching about, if that makes sense. So you mentioned earlier on, Katie, that instead of Nike telling us what we want, we would be telling Nike what, what instead of Nike telling us what we want, we would be telling Nike, Nike what we want. What, yeah. How does that work? What, what would that look like if I get onto my computer one day and I'm looking for shoes, how would my interaction with Nike be different than what it is now? So I think in that sense, like before, let's just think about like the, the, com the consumer journey before. The consumer okay. journey before would be the company, Nike in this case, might do like some focus groups. They might do some testing of product and send it out there and see how it sits with the people. They kind of have, let's say the the sales cycle or the, per, the product development cycle probably would be much longer than it is now. So now what we see is we see what people are doing. Social media is constantly quicker. So now Nike goes out there and says, what are people mm -hmm. doing with my product and how yeah. do I need to adapt it better so that they use it more, they use it in circumstances, how I want it to be used, et cetera. So in the user, because they're sharing so much of that data and so much of that information back through social media channels, through mostly social media, I think at this point, it's a way, it's kind of what we're saying is it has to be quicker and therefore they take what people or users are doing and implement it. So it's quite different than it was before in the sense of, for example, influencers. Before Michael Jordan, okay, might be a bad example, but Michael Jordan was mm -hmm. the face of Nike. And now mm -hmm. a lot of people look more to people on the street, like some kid playing ball in a cool, pool, cool pair of shoes might influence them a lot more. We know that that is actually the truth, that those are influencing people more. For example, Kim Kardashian, nothing that she promotes really sells. They know that it's not her image sells, but actually what she's promoting and her products don't necessarily sell. There's a five time. We know that consumer generated content will actually have five times more value than something like if Kim Kardashian promotes it. So what consumer is generated content is five times more valuable than finish that again. That's a very powerful statement content. you just made. Yeah. Then professional, co professionally produced content. So, so the uh, user, example, the user yeah. sending out content about a particular product or service versus the company. Right. All right. That's a key. So that's like, a great concept. 
Yeah. yeah. So if you think about, for example, a company, I was just on a panel last week in Dubai and a guy was on the panel and he said they spent $100,000 to do a video for a campaign and they right. got like 3,000 likes. And then some kid came along for the same product and did a 15 second TikTok and it went viral and I got like 5 million views and it was free because it, right. they didn't, it was the consumer that did it. And he was said, it just goes to show us that if we don't need to be investing what we invested anymore because it's not what we say, it's what how it's being used in the street because it's more applicable. People can touch it, they can feel it, and people are more interested in it. So the, this feels like it's a trend that I've been noticing over a while. You mentioned this as well, that you have, like my wife would be, say, mentions that when she's looking for clothing, it's not necessarily the Nordstrom of the world, the Gucci's of the world that she's going to, but it's those influencers on these different social media platforms who are talking about certain things. And of course, they're probably compensated in some way by right. that kind of influence. So is that a kind of an indication of this Web3 world that we're moving toward? I mean, are we already there or are there some major other things that we just haven't tackled yet? Yeah, I mean, I, I would argue that that's more of like a Web 2.5 because you haven't put in the technology and the actual kind of monetization behind it, which is what blockchain would do. But mm. it's, you know, I always say we have like the traditional big advertising that Leo Burnett would do. And then we have Web 2.5, which is kind of the Instagram advertising influencers. And then we move into Web 3.0 when we can actually monetize that directly from the creator to the brand. Right now, there's a lot of steps in between, but Web 3 can take away a lot of those steps. And so the creator has a lot more power. IP can change. There's a ton of applications, really, of how you can use it. Wow. Okay. So blockchain cryptocurrency has had a bit of a, a rough patch of late. Tell us a little bit more about that. And what's your, what's your prognosis, doctor? Yeah. <laughs> well, we, I, I always want to be positive and think that it's going to be, it's going to be okay. But actually today, just uh, coincidentally, I had three different calls with people saying the bull market is coming back. I think crypto is not dead. It can't be dead. I think there are a lot of people that think it is just because we've seen a lot of up and downs, but I think we're so soon, it's so early that it's really hard for us to, to predict a true future, but it is the future. I mean, it is the future of any sort of, especially for finance. Finance has proved, we've just proved over the last week with the fall of two traditional financial systems and banks that- true. Okay, that blockchain will be needed. It will be needed for speed. It will be needed for globalization. And it also will be needed, a big thing is um, emerging markets. So right now it's very hard if you're an emerging market to compete in the world economy. And blockchain can definitely help with that because you know breaks down barriers to entry because there's no central point, if that makes sense. Uh, sort of. I'll, n I'll nod my head. And to pretend that I understand everything you're talking about. <laughs> Some things I just don't. How does a company that is already, say, ensconced in traditional banking, finance, investment transition over to blockchain or, or do they? Are they just the dinosaurs that need to maybe recreate themselves? No, not at all. For example, we're speaking, uh, we have an advisor or mentor to us who one of kind of an important person at MasterCard, and they're already very much into it. So payments, and that could just mean that you, for example, making this podcast could pay your advertisers in crypto. Mm. And any revenue you made, you can have a MasterCard on your phone and MasterCard, you know, those tokens can then be real money and you can mm. use it and it's Apple Pay. So there's, tons of applications and a lot of banks are going towards it. I mean, you can tokenize assets, which is getting That's into NFT, right? Yeah. Well, no, it's not necessarily NFT. So like um, you own a building and that's a real world asset and you want to make sure you get extra money from it, you can tokenize it. And therefore you're kind of working in a new economic system of tokens. 
it gets a bit complex, but yeah, I know. So we almost like need to go back to to finance one hundred and one, but call it crypto one hundred and one, just to be yeah. able to understand the complexity of this. Because I think there are some people, you know, the early adapters probably get this, you know, and understand it, and are probably going to be the pioneers, you know, the Lewis and Clark's of this entire yes. new economy, <laughs> right? They're going to see the Pacific Ocean and go, yes, it really exists, right? And they're yes. going to do very, very well. And there's a lot of us out there that were still in you know, the, still on the East Coast going like, what the hell? I don't even know it's real. I think you're crazy. I mean, and I think a lot of people are in that boat. Are there ways for people to take some, you know, baby steps into this new wide, wide world of Web3? And what would they be given your background and experience? Yeah, I think I always say this to people that if you want to learn the best ways, podcasts and just reading, honestly, if you're really yeah. interested in it, and starting easy, like looking at how there's lots of different, for example, Instagram was going to try and make NFTs, just understanding what an NFT is, for example, or looking at something as simple as a pay, different types of what Bitcoin is or what Ethereum actually is, like the, the actual technology. But there's tons of different podcasts and different articles and applications that you can kind of start. But the easiest Stuff, I think, is probably creator economy. So stuff around fashion, stuff around decentralized social or social media. That stuff is a little bit easier to understand. So start start by listening, really. You said creator economy. That's basically your phrase there. Yeah, creator okay. economy. Just people that make money off of, like you, you're, a crea- you're part of the creator economy. <laughs> oh boy, where's my t-shirt and my, my yeah. coffee mug? <laughs> So now I have to ask, I mean, this is, uh, this is really just uh, almost like for me and, and companies of our size, but like would a, an organ, a small organization like us, you know, be able to tap into this particular new economy? And if so, how? I mean, we do, obviously we have, you mentioned being able to uh, monetize, you know, advertisers on a podcast. That's one thing. Right. But obviously, all of our clients right now pay us in what you might call the old economy, right? We get, there's peer purchase orders and they would fulfill on them. And we're on a, you know, a particular contract for a certain number of whatever's we do. And that's how it goes. It goes from one bank to another. Our organizations now at that point where they would start even considering, you know, paying in this new economy, in a sense, paying through cryptocurrency. Right. Yeah, I think actually, I think I talked to someone the other day that's trying to do a podcast, what we would say on chain. So building it on blockchain. And that then means that you could probably, like you could sell it as an NFT. If someone really, really loved an episode, they could make an, you can make an episode an NFT. And then they could, let's say you monetize somehow. I don't know what you're, how you're monetizing the podcast, but if that, episode was every time someone listened to it made like 10 bucks right then that person that owned the nft could get two percent of it or whatever however you wanted to to build that that business model you you can build it into the smart contract how much you want to share in terms of right so the person who's listening to would in a sense purchase the the ability to listen to it right Right. but yeah 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 you could do that but yeah. They would also like own it. Let's say it's like someone super famous that you're interviewing it and is. they want to own that interview in that moment. They could buy the NFT of it. And then every time it someone listened to it, I don't know if that's true. Every time it's listened to, does it make money? Let's pretend it does, you know, like on Spotify. Then every time someone listened to it, that person that owned the NFT could make a portion of money. Oh my God. Wow. We are in a brave new world here for sure. This is amazing. <laughs> My head's a little bit spinning here, Katie. <laughs> it is complex when you try and break it. It's easy when you're in it, obviously. I, right, right. Well, you're one of the foremost experts on it. So, of course, this is your backyard. Right. <laughs> this is your bread and butter. Fascinating. So, and when you start envisioning out, say, 10, 15 years, where more of our rank and file society has moved into this space, and let's say a lot more companies are much more familiar with it. They're educated on it. They're using this particular type of economy. Web3 is now the new norm. How do you feel leadership will change? I mean, from the, from the day-to-day behaviors of a leader, because 
you know, in some ways, leaders adapt to the environment in which they are in. 100 years ago, 150 years ago, leadership was what it was, given the fact that we were just starting the Industrial Revolution, right? We were, we were building manufacturing plants when before then it was, you know, small farms and small mom and pa organizations and, and retail places. And all of a sudden now we had 400, 500 people working together, which was unheard of. That was brand new. That was the, that was the blockchain of the day, right? That was the big right. deal. So, so of course, leadership had to change as a result of that, those changes. We, as we get into this new world regarding blockchain and the, the Web3, how do you envision leadership changing? What does that look like? Or do we even know yet? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really good question because I think I, obviously it will change. I think that in terms of blockchain, and I, I guess my world is more startup blockchain world. You also have, there are some really big blockchain companies right now that are like, you know, conglomerates. Binance, for example, it's decentralized, but they have offices with tons of people. So I'm sure the way they run that company is very different than my reality. But what I see the most, I think, is the very much the difference of you are, it's almost on, more entrepreneurial in the sense of you're kind of running against time. And so the sense leadership is really empowering in the sense of like, we need more ideas. We need more collaboration. We need to figure out how we're getting from X to Z like today and how we can do that. And I think in that sense, it feels very much like we're all at the table versus uh -huh. We have like the manager team that comes up with one thing and then like the project team. Even though we do have those different teams, it's all very Correct. collaborative and in one because you're moving so fast. There's no room for kind of going back to the to and thinking too long and having like a focus group. Our focus groups have to be today and last from this morning to this afternoon and have an implementation plan. So I think the way you'll see leadership and good leadership will be giving a lot of empowerment to teams and really welcoming new ideas and innovation and pushing for that. You know, people, I think when I interview people, what's very different is we don't necessarily even look to see if people have like gone to college anymore, because for us, it's more important how many projects you've built and how you built them and how fast you built them. So yes. for us, it's more, it's that reality has really switched. You know, you just, you want to know reference wise what you've done, what people have done, how they did it, and how quickly they could do it. So I think good leaders in this space will be able to recognize good talent and be able to give that talent kind of it's it's actually if you listen to like Steve Jobs talk, I think he probably was definitely he wasn't probably he was onto something and his leadership style, I think, is very much aligned with with what I see in my everyday life. So it sounds like it's a world of fast pace, which was already, we're pretty fast as it is, much more collaborative, much more entrepreneurial, if you will. Yeah. Uh, we got to get things produced as quickly as possible. There's something about that that is interesting because I understand it from the value for anything that you're creating to get it out quickly and to get it out in a collaborative way. And there's also this other aspect that sometimes the pressure to produce quickly is the thing that holds us back from the production, that the speed at which we are moving is the reason why we can't, that there's not the time for uh, a slow pace uh, for the, I, uh, you know what, I don't know if I'm, I have an idea right now, but I'm going to go take a nap. Yeah. Or I'm going to go walk around the block. I'm going to go run down to the river and yeah. maybe an idea will come that way. Or maybe it won't. And there's a certain sort of what I wonder about is will leadership look more like what we expect technology to produce? Have we in some ways created a reverse anthropomorphized state whereby we expect speed with our phones? Now we expect that same speed with our people. And mm -hmm. is that non human? To expect that? Are we changing the sort of the expectations of humanity by trying to replicate the behaviors of people's interactions to that of our technology? I think it's probably true because if you think about my world, for example, we rarely really use email. Everything is Telegram, WhatsApp, 
black. It's instant. Everything is instant. There's right. there's not enough time in the day to get things done, to get collaborate. Everything is very much about collaboration because in order to grow and to build and to scale at speed, you can't do that alone. So it's a lot about partnerships. And so it definitely, I think we push the limits to what is human and what is not human. I mean, sometimes you just can't meet a deadline, but you're up till midnight, like a, you have to do it, you, ha- you know, and you're dealing with a global, a new global world. Half my team is on one side of the world, half on the other. So right. I do, I do think that that, that, and now we have like this jet ch- chat GPT, which is, I right. had a fascinating call the other day with a partner of ours, VC, who is, does his whole thesis is super interesting, basically saying that we talk a lot about security in Web3, the importance of finding, building very good security for people to make sure they don't get their money stolen, their assets, all that stuff. Right. But he said, issue won't be, so we talk a lot about digital identity to make sure it's really you, right? Mm-hmm. But he said, the future really isn't about a human stealing your ID or a human trying to you know, hack into your Amazon. It really is going to be about machines because we're giving, it's, you know, it's the, it's the um, Terminator thesis of we're right. going to you get over to machines and and what does that look like in that but even essence? like yeah like if i read a blog and i've got blogs i think they're all over the place right and so in chat gpt could of course take the concept of what i wrote meld it in with other concepts and write some sort of thesis based for some 12 year old in you know poughkeepsie new <laughs> york right and i would never know that no but it wasn't my my paper it wasn't my blog it was the idea that came from it. So then how do you then hold on to the IP or do you? Do we no longer have IP in the new world? Right. I mean, I think it's a fascinating question. And I'm a, like, I my past life is I wrote a lot. So I'm a writer at heart. So for me, I'm like, we're not using it. And everyone around me is using it. So now I finally said to the team, okay, figure out how much it is because I just want to play around with it. But it right. feels so against like my... Oh, Core. I know what you mean. My dad was a writer for 35 years, you know, and the poor yeah. guy's rolling over in his grave right now, I'm sure, because of what's going on. And, you know, poor, he was a, a wonderful sort of uh, representation of authenticity. It's got to come from you, you know, don't plagiarize. And I remember, yeah. like, but dad, you know, the, the Encyclopedic Britannica said so. And like, no, you can't use that. You, have to, you put it in your own words. He said it all the yeah. time. But I do, th- I have tried ChatGP. In fact, I had an article that I had to write over the weekend, and I just put in the title, I said, basically, you know, it needs to be X number of words, and it needs to be the first person, whatever, present tense, whatever. I kind of created the parameters. They created something, and they go, well, that's sort of bland. And I decided, it gave me some idea, but then I rewrote the whole thing, and they didn't use an article, (laughs) a piece of it. So it kind of got me out of that proverbial staring at the white piece of paper and going, "Ah, now what? It got me out yeah. of that stage into an idea, which for one hand was a, was a positive, but sometimes we'll use it for just summaries of things, you know, like, all right, take this big bunch of text and, and summarize it using bullet points. Yeah, that works. And we're not going to put it on the web. And so there's not really plagiarized. So it's, it's just an internal document. But yeah, it's, and that's an interesting piece in and of itself. Yeah. It helps maybe with the ideation, I guess. Right. But, uh- the hard kind of sitting there and like you say at the white paper. But if you take that kind of idea into leadership, will we come up with another chat GPT that's going to say like, this is the situation I'm in. How do I handle it? So, <laughs> and well, you could do chat GPT and ask it a, a yeah. question about how we keep the human spirit and the core competencies of what it is to be human, not to be overrun by these technologies like chat GPT. <laughs> you know, it says what it, I mean, I do wonder about that. I mean, I am fascinated and I am quite frankly titillated in some ways yeah. by these these new technologies. I am finding that in our coaching and consulting business, there are some really strong benefits to be able to add more value to you know the human experience. And I can also see that they can be part of what runs us into a kind of a, a depressed, overly <laughs> worked you know, frenetic set of people who who are sort of feeling very unfulfilled because we forgot who we are. Yeah. Yeah. 
I think, and that's the thing, we have to find that line between how do we kind of embrace these new technologies to be a part of our new reality, but at the same time, make sure we know that it's technology. It's not, you know, the humanness. Because for example, in Web3, there's a lot of talk about metaverse, which is, you know, basically VR. I mean, it's not really that much yet. It's, but Yeah, it's Zuckerberg's world. Yeah. yeah, it's just a virtual world. But people, there's even parts of VR or metaverse where it actually can make you feel like you're at a beach, like the sensation. But to me, that's so sad. I'm like, I still want to touch the sand. I still want to feel what those, like, I don't want to lose feeling in my life. So, but, but we're moving to a place where technology will be able to replace. So we no longer need Prozac. We'll just need like a oh, VR. Just, well, and a, the porn industry is going to go crazy over this, yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, like, my God, <laughs> they're like chomping at the bit. But I guess even um, about that. Good point. Good point. There's some <laughs> somebody was asking some uh, because I'm of a different generation. You know, I, I remember I'm dating myself when email was was the new thing. You know, like I remember yeah. being in a facilitated uh, kind of a business meeting and somebody said, all right, how many here in the room actually know what email is? And, you know, three <laughs> out of 15 raised their hand like, well, what the hell is email? You know, it was only the big companies that had it. The smaller ones didn't have it. So that's how old I am, you know, but <laughs> I guess I would remember hearing from somebody that they were interviewing a person in their 20s or whatever. And they said, well, does it matter to you if you are in a VR world, a virtual reality world, and you're experiencing the beach? Does that bother you that it's not the real beach? And he goes, no. I know. They don't See, care. I'm myself because I was on a panel at another conference talking about the same thing. And the guy was like, it's fine. And I said, I might be dating myself, but I want to feel sand. I right, don't right. want to tell me it's sand. <laughs> well, God, it's, it's amazing. So I guess in some ways, you know, there's a, there's a train coming and we have to ask ourselves whether we want to get on or not. And, or to what degree do, do we, do we want to just be on the full journey or just get off at some point? And I also, I'm thinking as you're talking that the, like in any sort of economy, those that understand and can play in that economy uh, are going to benefit financially from a education perspective, from, you know, healthcare, all the other parts of which society can provide its people. And I can see that, you know, if one at some point doesn't understand this, they won't be able to participate in it. If they can't participate in it, they're not going to benefit from it. It's like, right. uh, you know, if you don't understand the language of Mandarin, you're not going to be able to walk around Beijing, China and understand how right. to get to the restaurant of your choice, right? You don't right. know the right. language. How can I play a part of this, right? I don't understand soccer. So how do I know where to kick the ball? I don't know where the boundaries are. I don't know the rules of the game. And right. it's, it's going to be a, almost like it could be a division of who has and who doesn't, who understands this technology and who doesn't. And I think right. that what you're sort of making me wonder is, there's a part of me that feels like, personally, I need to understand this, at least to know what it is that I don't want to get involved in or what I do want to get involved in. Right. No, I agree. And there's actually kind of, there's actually different bits to this in the sense of, we say the promise of what- no pun intended, huh? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. In the sense of like, um, the the idea is that the promise to kind of level the economic playing field is what we say so but but so we talk about metaverse that's kind of what first world problems right but we talk about like being able to have a driver's license as a woman in certain countries in the middle east or in africa that yeah. is definitely not a first world problem and that is something a very real problem but if we could build some sort of digital identity that a breaks down the barrier of cost and be maybe the barrier of actually having to have like a male go with you or whatever the barriers might be. Um, we're allowing more people to come into play. So we know Cardano is uh, one of the founders of Ethereum. There were three, I think, three or four, I always forget. And one of them was Charles, I forgot his last name, and he left Ethereum. He broke from Vitalik and then he started his own <laughs> protocol or blockchain called Cardano, Ooh. which kind of not taken up very, I mean, it was pretty strong at the beginning and now you don't hear much, but he did a big campaign in Africa about two years ago, maybe, for digital identity. And the idea is that 
in certain African countries, it's super expensive to have a driver's license. And in order to yeah. do anything basic, go to school, have health care, whatever, you need to have an ID. But if you were to make it digital and anyone could access that and there's education around that, you now bring you know, a huge population on, into the system of education, of healthcare, of all that stuff. So it has this amazing promise if it's applied correctly and if it's invested in it and if there are, pro- there are a lot of projects doing a lot of these things. So that's the that's interesting thing you bring up, though, that if it's done correctly. So there's a moral component to all this, too, which is to yes. say, what's the right thing to do? And I, I think that some people will listen to this and they go, yeah, but... What if this becomes, uh, the, you know, the the wizard of Oz behind the curtain is really our government, who is now have access to all of this information and then can manipulate and control under the guise that we have autonomy? What is, what's being said about that particular concern? And is that a concern? So if you're using blockchain technology, that's not a concern because you don't mm-hmm. have a centralized database. It's everything that's the point of it's a chain with lots of it's blocks. It's decentralized. That's right. Okay. Right. But you do have a sense of uh, what programs are invested in because if an African nation wants to bring this, you know, type of technology on board, maybe it's of their in their interest to not do certain things. So there, in, in that sense, there's there's power and there's freedom there. But the actual technology in itself, that's the strength of it. Is that no government can dictate behind the scenes and own it. It's Even a digital it. ID. Correct. So no. digital ID is, again, under the premise, under the platform of a blockchain Technology. decentralized. Yeah. So, all right. So what are, <laughs> I mean, if you were a government official in, say, you know, a, a, a ruthless country, would you be concerned about this technology? I'm sure, because it takes your power away, for sure. The more power people are given, the less you have. So in certain countries, I'm sure it would not be welcomed. Um, I'm so is, sure. this, is this technology, in a sense, if you were to sort of create a political coefficient, become really a democracy? Or um, how would you phrase it if you were to say, you know, this is not an oligarch, this is not you know, a dictatorship. This is a democracy. Does, is the technology following sort of that principle around yeah, individual rights? Actually, yeah, I think it probably goes even further. I think there's kind of almost a utopian notion to it. The very the kind of everyone has equal. If, if you were to look up what socialism is in terms of a, a, not an economic system, but a, a, a political system, it would probably be equated to that in the sense that your power is yours. So all of your assets are yours. All of all of your ID is yours. Huh. There's no centralized dictator or anyone owning anything. Versus the socialist economic system, which is we are going to basically distribute wealth across the board and take from them those and give to the... We're not saying that. Okay. No, no. Do, are there... Who owns what assets and whose is what? So, Katie, are there companies, maybe yours as well, that actually can work with an organization, be a large or small? And, and I'm thinking assessment, like, let's just take a look at what you do and let's take and let's give you some ideas about what you could do relative to this, um, this new technology that this, these new platforms. Are there, are there out there? And, and do you guys do that? Tell me more about that. Yeah, absolutely. There's t- there's quite a few companies that are doing that that are helping kind of more traditional tech firms or just traditional companies move into the Web three space, kind of sharing what pieces the, of their company they could change over, where there could be more revenue streams by using tech different technologies. And yes, we have something that we do do. So we'll have, for example, brands. A lot of brands will want to move into Web3. We can help them with a brand strategy of how you use your current assets and then move into Web3. Or creators like yourself, how do I take my product and make it into Web3 and create a new revenue stream? Um, Mm. But that's definitely something we do. It's my background is consulting and my co-founder's background is tech consulting. So Brilliant. we are able to to help companies do that and kind of understand it from a more rudimentary perspective. 
I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued. Okay. All right. We may have to talk afterwards here. So, sure. uh, Katie, this is great. Uh, I think you've given us all a um, sort of the the first glimpse for some of us into this new world and for others, um, a reinforcement of what's coming. And I, I do think that is, so long as we are informed consumers, we're informed citizens, we know sort of the changes in our world then we can make decisions about to what degree do we want to you know, participate or not. But if we aren't under, we don't understand, if we don't have education around that, then we are at the effect of that other's decisions. And you certainly have helped in that. How can people follow what you're about, connect with you, learn more about your organization? Well, I'm mostly on LinkedIn and Twitter. So just I'm at Katie Romero on Twitter and then just my name, Katie Romero Finger on LinkedIn. And then our company website is uh, babslabs.io. You can check us out there. And then I do do quite a bit of speaking, so and try and Good. bring some of these topics up. So and we announce that on our website, is or not our website, on LinkedIn and our social media. So yeah, I'm going to try and That's start great. writing a bit more too. There's all this, you know, content is king, right? A queen or whatever. So yeah. trying to build a podcast maybe too, but it's just, it's hard. Don't have enough hours in the day, as always. Right, because you got to get it up by the end of the day, right? Exactly. Yeah. By the way, we have. I could connect it to somebody who would like, who might be a, a resource for you with respect to a, a podcast if you're ever interested. Yeah, absolutely. Love yeah. That. <laughs> but Katie, it's been really great to talk to you, and definitely going to kind of follow what you're all about. I think that this is a a fascinating topic and we need to know more about it. And you certainly give us some good ideas about what this is all about. Thank you. And I think you've given me something super interesting to think about, which is leadership and how it will change in this new technological realm. Cause I haven't really thought about it, but I do think it's a topic that will be interesting to explore. So we'll write a you. blog on it and we'll, yeah, and we'll, we'll connect to it. We'll send it off because I think that's a, like any leadership, it always is trying to be proactive, but it has to be cognizant of the changes in the environment. You think about, say, you know, the famous book, uh, How the Mighty Fall, Jim Collins, talks a lot about how organizations get too myopic into their own success and they miss the outside world and how it's changing. And if they don't pay attention to that, that becomes their demise. And there's just dozens and dozens of examples of major companies that we all know about that fell to this particular sense of uh, myopic, almost arrogance around, we know what's going on, screw the outside world, right? Right. But yeah. you know, like, you know, there's just examples, examples around that. But I think that leaders need to have an eye out for this, at least that, but at least also the second part is to your point, how are we going to need to change as leaders in this new world? You know, it's already here. It's already at our doorstep. Are we adapting to it? Are we going to be dinosaurs that will eventually become not, you know, how do we even train people, you know, onboard them? How do we create training programs? How do we coach people? Are the competencies different? You know, all these things I think are, are, are should be discussed because it's coming, it's here. And if it's not us, somebody else. Right. Yeah, I think that's super true. And I think mm -hmm. the how the book that you mentioned, it's a great book, is super, super relevant in this space because people become so evangelized that there are times where, I mean, I remember, I think I, my brother called me and was like, can you believe what happened? I think it's like another mass shooting in the States or something. And I hadn't yeah. even heard about it yeah. because the whole day is just my world. And that's really scary at some level. You have to be, you have to make sure you're looking at what's happening in the whole landscape or you right. will, you will fall at some level. So yeah, I think it will be really interesting to see what happens. Now, and this last couple of weeks have been interesting because the mix of traditional finance and crypto finance has meshed with the fall of uh, Silicon Valley Bank and now Swiss, uh, Swiss, what is it? Oh, Swiss Bank and Bank. UBS. Yeah. 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 UBS and all that. UBS. And there's so much correlation that now the conversations are starting to mix, like where and the lines are blurring more. So I think. I think that's going to be something interesting and probably need to to focus on that and what that means for business, leadership, everything, you know, it's, it's changing. Fascinating. It's really yeah. fascinating. Well, Absolutely. great to have you. I really enjoyed this conversation. Yeah, me too. It's great to meet you. And thanks for having me. I look forward to staying connected. You bet. Thank you for listening to the Business of Intuition. If you enjoyed the show, 
please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to learn more about Dean or Mission Facilitators Leadership, go to mfileadership.com. That's mfileadership.com.